Do you want to count it in? Me and Rocky cuddle and watch Smack DVD. I don't cuddle. Y'all intuition a lot because the white man said you gotta wear pants. It's going for you. You're on the air with Shane Powers. Take requests. I'll whoop your ass. Yo, girlfriend look like my mom. Uh, Yo, why you out here with your boxes on, bro? Why you got no underwear? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay. Well, since you want to be Mr. Man, fucking no secret man. agent, no what song do you want to hear? No, no more. Man, man, come on. The one about me. If Tyler never made music, he's still a legend. Mm -hmm. Tyler's a very he's different a individual. Person. He is, yeah, man. Yeah, he's a pure soul. For sure. Yeah, he is, man. And I think that's why he continues to win. My whole life, I felt like a stepchild in school, at home, and especially in music and rap where I uh, have a profession. And they try to push you to the side, keep doing that. And it's like 10 years late, I'm still here, bro. My career has only been doing this. Only been Ninth grade, they wouldn't let me join band class because I couldn't read music. But I still had the passion, and I'm on two instruments now, picking up a third. It's niggas who's the hottest shit in 2012. Where the fuck they at right now? Niggas push me to the side and give me no, that nigga like weird other. Uh, and we could uh, and I'm fucking here right now, right now. Skin glowing, pockets heavy, the wide ceiling, house done. Looking for a lake house right now. Come to my fucking witness. All my niggas good, family good, healthy. But when all that happened. I said, fuck them. I didn't let none of that shit stop me from doing anything that I wanted to do. And that's because the, the people that I think are innovators was the people I looked up to, like the Pharrells, the Kanye's, the Hype Williams, the Dave Chappelle's, the Erica Badu's, the, the Andre 3000's. And while I don't think I'm an innovator, but they are, I know it's a common thread between us. And, I feel like we're all free and we create from this honest place, this really honest space where we don't give a fuck what no one says. And because of that, that's why I always felt like a stepchild. Bitch, where we at with it? LA, bitch. Where we at with it? LA, bitch. Where we at with it? And there he stood, beside music legends Charlie Wilson and Boys to Men as they sang an a cappella rendition of Tyler's hit song, Earth Queen. Riding around and kicking me out, making my arms. Making my arms. Up to this point in his career, Tyler Creator tirelessly worked at his craft and intentionally molded himself into a respectable musician for over 10 years, all to accomplish one of his lifelong goals. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. So talented in that category. Wonderful musicians who did their thing. This is for us. Winning a Grammy Award. Don't leave. It's my fault. Tyler's collaboration with Charlie Wilson and Boyz II Men proved his ability to bridge both generational and genre gaps. The group sang around a flaming barrel, reminiscent of young men in the 70s on the East Coast. Boyz II Men hailing from Philadelphia and growing up in the early 1970s might have been directly influenced by scenes of young men striving for success and recognition during that era. As an artist who's felt overlooked and underappreciated for so long, the flaming barrel can also be seen as a metaphorical beacon, illuminating a path forward fueled by Tyler's ambition, creative passion, and hunger for success. But when the harmonious vocals slowly fade, we find Tyler by himself prepared to take this performance in a completely different direction. Performing New Magic Wand with this harsh undertone in his voice and these sharp, aggressive lyrics, Tyler's decision to contrast the smooth, melodic beginning of his performance was a left turn for the unsuspecting audience. Together, 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 baby. Oh. Oh. 
when Boys to Men and Charlie Wilson return to give one last dose of their harmonic melodies before the song's conclusion, their vocals act as this calm before the storm. Tyler the Creator has grown into an artist who's always tried to find the perfect juxtaposition of ugly and pretty in his music, combining the ugliest uglies with the prettiest pretties. This performance proves to be a true testament to that. Embracing risk as an artist and embracing challenges that will follow said risk is an undeniable characteristic of Tyler the Creator. Mimicking the act of blasting himself with a finger gun and falling backward into the fire behind him not only marked a powerful conclusion to his performance but symbolized the artist leaping into the unknown. Whether planned or not, whether the flaming barrel stood prominently for a specific reason or because Tyler simply thought it looked cool. Whether anything in this performance happened intentionally or inadvertently, this finale proved to be without a doubt symbolic of Tyler the Creator crossing a threshold in his career as an artist. It would only be a couple hours later that Tyler would win his very first Grammy Award for his album Eagle receiving recognition for best rap album. Even after winning his first Grammy following five solo albums in almost a decade of making music, Tyler the Creator couldn't help but feel a certain irritation with the category he won in. On one side, I'm very grateful that uh, what I made could just be, you know, uh, acknowledged in a world like this. Um, but also, it sucks that whenever we, and I mean guys that look like me, do anything that's genre bending or that's anything they always put it in a rap or urban category which is and i don't like that urban word it's just a politically correct way to say the n-word to me so when i hear that i'm just like why can't we just be in pop why can't it just, you know what i mean so I, I felt like half of me feels like the the rap nomination was a backhanded compliment like oh uh my little cousin wants to play the game let's give him the unplug controller so he could shut up and feel good about it. That, that's what it felt like a bit, but another half of me is very grateful that the art that I made could be acknowledged on a level like this when I don't do the radio stuff, I'm not played in Target, I'm in a whole different world than what a lot of people here listen to, so I'm grateful and like, eh. This evening at the Grammy sums up Tyler's artistic career in such a poetic way. Tyler the Creator has always been an artist who's never exactly hit the mark for mainstream media and recognition. Regardless of the depth, attention to detail, and storytelling infused in his work, Tyler has been continuously looked over, pushed to the sidelines, and treated like a little cousin with an unplugged controller. Because of this, Tyler created his own lane, his own world, and his own recognition. Tyler the Creator paved an entirely new road to create his own success for himself and for artists to follow in his footsteps while continuously being overlooked and downplayed. But after this night at the Grammy Awards, things would begin to change, for better or for worse. So let's dive in and explore the journey that led to this pivotal moment in his career and what he was able to make of himself in the years afterwards as we take a deep dive into the life and legacy of the stepchild of hip-hop, Tyler the Creator. Born March 6, 1991 in Hawthorne, California, Tyler Gregory Okoma alongside his sister Linda was raised by a single mom. Unfortunately, there's a lack of information on his dad besides the fact that he's Nigerian. Your dad's here. The absence of Tyler's dad would serve to play a large role in his life, but we'll get back into that a little later. His mom loved to play jazz music around the house, which helped shape Tyler's artistic taste growing up. From the young age of seven, he found himself taking apart CD cases to create his own imaginary album covers with accompanying track lists and song lists using just paper and crayons. Since a kid, I didn't really play with toys, but I loved CDs, and every time I go to my mom's friend's house, I would see what CDs they have and just open it and read the credits and try to learn as much about them. Spending the majority of his time skateboarding, teaching himself piano, and discovering some of his early musical influences, a young Tyler would find himself truly falling in love with music. He gravitated to artists like Stevie Wonder, D'Angelo, and Erica Badu. And I remember being nine because I bought that on my ninth birthday, mm -hmm. 2000. I was just like, God, you were such a weird nine-year-old for your friends. I bet no, you. Just thought I was, you know how hard it is like on your ninth birthday going to buy a Mila Rouge Infinite Possibility? 
only that person one. who thinks you're red is the person behind the counter Bro, at the record it was, store. It was around the age of 11, Tyler would randomly hear the song Tape You by NERD on the radio. The band's fusion of funk, rock, and soul must have exceptionally resonated with a young Tyler because the band NERD, and more specifically band member Pharrell, will become one of Tyler the Creator's biggest inspirations musically. It was Easter 2002, and I heard the song Tape You from a search of on the radio. Like, what the f is this is the greatest song I ever heard. And then a couple months later, I never found out who it was. And a couple months later, I was at the laundry mat, sitting in the car, waiting for the car to drive my mom. And running, the sun came on. And this is the craziest shit I ever heard. Then I finally found out that those two songs were the f you know, by the same band. Right, right, right. And ever since I found out who that was, I've been a f stand for the Neptunes and clips and just that. When he wasn't listening to music, Tyler would hang out around Ladera Heights, going to local skate parks and music stores. This video comes from Tyler's old YouTube channel created with his friend Jasper. He titled the channel Blocks Head and was also a pseudonym he went under at the time. It was a shitty fucking camera, but yeah, me and Jasper used to put all of our uh, stupid skits on there. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's do these. Cause I was like, one day, man, I'm gonna get us a show on Adult Swim. The YouTube channel still stands today and serves as a raw glimpse into the early life of Tyler the Creator, messing around with his friends, breaking sidekicks for apparently no reason at all, and making some of his first music. Put it in my dad's ass in a pickle so he giggles and I'm kinda like the wiggle, I wiggle. No homo. Being inspired by MF Doom, he would go on to make multiple MySpace accounts under different names to share his earliest music through the platform, ranging from rap to jazz to electronic. How many MySpace pages did you have, like in the very beginning? Because you worked hard, didn't you? I have four, maybe five. A personal one, another one, and the title of the creator one was me just posting um, at 15 um, all my art, all of my t-shirt designs and all my instrumentals. I had another one called Polymana where it was just like super weird electronic beats. Releasing music under pseudonyms Ace the Creator, Polymano, and of course Tyler the Creator, Tyler put out a significant amount of mixtapes and EPs at an early age, like Stereotype, which has an early feature from Casey Veggies, and At Your Risk, which sounds heavily inspired by Pharrell. As a result of MySpace accidentally deleting nearly all their music that was uploaded to their website prior to 2016, a lot of Tyler's early work has since been lost, though there are some internet archivers who dug up a bit of his work. Eventually in 2009, an 18-year-old Tyler Ukauma would run with the stage named Tyler the Creator simply because it was the MySpace account that started to get the most traction from his dark and infamous debut album, Bastard. Wait, 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 wait. Before we get into that, we need to go back a couple years. Remember Tyler and his friends running around Ladera Heights on YouTube? Nigga, you see? Look, look where we at, nigga. We in a book room, nigga. nigga we read, see. bitch. We read. Get, show them niggas a book. Nigga, this that gangsta That's shit. Oh. Yeah, those guys. That sparked the beginning to the creation of arguably one of the most important hip hop collectives in the early 2000s. And to tell the story of Tyler the Creator, we need to first lay down the foundation of who they are. My mom moved to Sacramento when I was 16. I stayed in LA with my grandmother. She lived in uh, Inglewood, the edge of Ladera and shitty apartments. Cause mm -hmm. Ladera is a nice area, but we was in like, the, ah, it was gross. And then I was, she was old as shit. So I kind of was like, on my own figuring it out. Being on his own for the first time, Tyler began to think of ideas to make a career out of his creative habits. And it wouldn't be long before he had an idea for a collective called Odd Future, or as their aunties know them, the Odd Future Wolf Gang kill them all, expletive, expletive. It's a bunch of fucking teenagers who just do bad shit knowing that we can go to jail and get in trouble for it. Cause we think it's fun. When I was 15, I had this idea of a magazine. So if you like live in Ladera and any of your shit got fucked up, it wasn't us. That I wanted to put skateboarding and art and music and photography and fucking ceramics, just all the little shit I was into. We don't but there's a possible chance that we might know the people who maybe probably could have possibly did it. But I mean, 
Why the fuck are we doing? Why, why when, am I talking when, like when, this? When they're not huckstering product, odd future record tracks that don't get played on the radio. Their lyrics are too provocative or puerile, depending on your point of view, and they have little time for political correctness. And that's what their young fans who follow them online seem to like best about them. I was like, okay, if I need, if I'm gonna make this magazine, I can't do it alone, so I gotta go find the good photographers in LA and the skaters and the musicians and the good writers and things like this. And while I gathered all these people and it didn't come to fruition, the magazine I wanted, we became this thing called Odd Future. It's a typical day in the day, you know what I'm saying? Just out hey, here could you get my it. eyes in the sun real quick? Why? Aren't they fucking beautiful? And I'm on Fairfax and I meet this kid named Travis. Y'all must know him as Taco. While Odd Future did start off with aspirations of creating a magazine, the group found themselves gravitating to writing and recording music in LA, recording in a place called The Trap, a nickname for Sid and Taco's house. Haji from Odd Future is like, yo, I got this spot that we could record at. It's this girl, she make beats, she real quiet and shit, but like, she got this, and her parents, guess how? She got a little studio set up. We pay her 20 bucks. We can record there for two hours. I'm like, nigga, say less. I got 10 on me right now. I go to the house and I meet this girl named Sid. Come to find out, Sid and Taco are fucking siblings. I'm like, what the fuck? Resorting to recording their verses on a laptop microphone, the group of young artists crafted the best project they could with the limited resources they had, as most of them were still broke teenagers in high school at the time. Okay, now what about your lyrics? What about them? What are you saying in your lyrics? Nothing. Shit to piss old white people off like you. Is that right? It wouldn't take long before the Odd Future tape came to fruition on November 15, 2008. The project was gritty with unconventional beats and featured this raw, unfiltered production. While the project wasn't polished by any means, it's important to remember Odd Future released this as a group of new young artists who haven't found their voice and identity yet. Creating with the limited resources they had, Odd Future just wanted to release something they could say they were proud of. One thing you gotta understand yeah. about OF is that we got famous off of our shit ideas. You know what I mean? <laughs> Your first drafts yeah. ever. We got famous off of ours. So people were judging us and basing us off of our fucking 19, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, like, like our yeah. first shit ever. The Odd Future tape was truly a handcrafted piece of work and the DIY feel to the mixtape evolved into a characteristic the Odd Future Collective embodied. Their mixtape took over the internet and gave Odd Future both a buzz and a cult following that would become the foundation of their success. So me, Jasper, Left Brain, Taco, we all on facts and shit. It's this fucking ugly ass kid, man. I'm just like, this nigga looks crazy, bro. I'm like, who is this kid? He's like, oh, his name is Tebe. I'm like, the fuck? So whatever, we all on this block hanging out. Find out this little nigga could rap. We bring him to the studio. This nigga just start rapping. And, What's your fucking rap name? And this nigga's like, Earl Sweatshirt. We're like, oh. Still sticking to their MySpace roots, they used the platform to recruit other artists to Hot Future. One of which being this guy named, uh, what was his name? I hope you're enjoying the video so far because it took a lot of time and energy to create. Which is why I want to talk about today's sponsor the video, my Patreon. For only $1 a month, you're not only supporting aspiring artists trying to gain success on YouTube, but you're also earning perks like early access to my videos, director's cuts where I talk about the creation process, and exclusive full length interviews that I use to make videos like this one possible. <laughs> and you know what we always say, it's only a dollar, so why don't you please give me a shot and put a smile on my face, a smile on yours, and a smile on yours, and mine. <laughs> we'll be right back. We're 
Like what people don't know is that I'm smarter than a lot of people. Just because I joke around and that, they don't understand how aware and smart that I really am. The group of young artists who were watching the internet develop before their eyes innately understood the importance of building an audience online. Which is impressive to think about when you realize they did this in an era where social media platforms were just in their earliest stages of growth. Outfeature already knew how to leverage the power and virality of the internet to connect with fans and establish their brand before that was a common practice. I had a template for my press releases with the logo at the top. It made people think that Odd Future was signed to some big marketing firm. But we weren't, it was just me. Odd Future truly established themselves as trailblazers in the blog era when it came to building a dedicated audience. They quickly realized that their lifestyle brand and presence online needed just as much, if not more attention than the actual music. Nothing, smoking weed every day and not having a job and man, making money. Well, initially I was drawn to them because I think their level of not caring and saying whatever they wanted was really appealing at the time. Like it was just a bunch of young kids just being rebellious. And when you're young, that's kind of the phase you're in. It's like a rebellious phase, like fuck school, fuck people, fuck everything. Right. But over time, they definitely evolved, especially Tyler, with being a little more mature with the content of his songs and kind of getting into deeper parts of his life. As they were growing older, I was growing older. Like, I was growing with them, in a sense. Like, bro, are you a millionaire still doing that? But people take things differently. I but don't you want to rap the best. You want to make the best shows, I, the best I videos. love this shit. I love it. You want to do your best. Right. You want to be the best version of yourself. I do, personally. I don't know about other motherfuckers, but like... When I won that gra I, when I was telling niggas I'm gonna get a Grammy when I was, you know, 19 years old and people was like, you'll never do that, bro. I would like those tweets because I know I'm gonna get one. I know I'm gonna get multiple. I know it. So I like them and I was like, oh, it's gonna be ill when I get it and I quote retweet this. <laughs> and I did that. As soon as I got that Grammy, I was like, yay, my niggas, ah, 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 yo, P, my mom, like, ah, cool. Whew, can't wait to quote retweet that. <laughs> Christmas Day, 2009. <laughs> <clears throat> Christmas Day 2009, a 17-year-old Tyler Okoma sleeping on his grandma's couch releases his debut album, Bastard. Releasing mainly on Datpimp and having a lack of retail availability, Bastard displayed the qualities of a mixtape, but Tyler refers to it as his debut album, so that's what we're gonna go with. The self-produced album created on FL Studio overflowed with these unsettling lyrics about violence, sexual assault, misogyny, and a shit ton of homophobia. All while this dark, dramatic, and heavily distorted production filled the atmosphere for most of its songs. I cut my wrist and play piano because I'm so depressed. Somebody caught a pass and his bastard is so possessed. This meeting just begun. Nigga, I'm saying. The influence of Eminem and MF Doom is unmistakable in Tyler's approach to creating his album, where he isn't being literal about the stories he tells, but rather paints a picture of a dark villainous character who navigates a world created by the artist. The entire the entire story that he tells on these albums is growth. It's personal growth. It's just growing older, but illustrating it in a way that's really, really like. Interesting. Bastard and the two albums to follow would show off Tyler's creativity and storytelling skills with a trilogy surrounding Tyler speaking to a therapist named Dr. TC at a summer camp called Camp Flognaw. Through this medium, he often blurs the line between what's real and what's fiction. Bastard showcased these glimpses of duality where the overbearing darkness in the production had these compact moments of bubbly lightheartedness. Since day one, I've always wanted to make the prettiest that's mm -hmm. borderline boring mm -hmm. or the hardest fucking sh and i've i've been trying to mix those together since my first album mm -hmm. literally the hardest sh and the prettiest sh while he wasn't quite there yet on bastard you could still see what he was trying to do blend the ugliest uglies with the prettiest pretties nonetheless tyler was slowly creating a name for himself as an artist to look out for tyler really like you know those our future guys you know, people who really do it themselves, like really do it themselves, who aren't just like, yo, check out my YouTube page, this shit is crazy. Like, I mean like really like, I made this album 
and I put it out and it's fucking something that you can't get somewhere else and I did it on my own and I'm not shoving it down your throat I'm putting it out in the world because like I love doing it like that's the real shit like I those guys really do that even though his debut album was met with mixed reviews bastard still managed to rank 32nd on pitchfork's top albums of 2010 list additionally the album birthed tyler's first music video to hit 1 million views on youtube with his song french french would serve not only to be his first big music video but also a key to a lifelong relationship a friend of tyler served as an intern at interscope records this friend would help tyler get into contact with David Arodi, who was the head of strategy at Interscope. And he was like, yo, uh, I know the guy that you could probably put your CD on a desk to. So I printed like five CDs with like a few songs on it. Um, this is 2010. And went to FedEx uh, in Culver City, printed like a cover or whatever. Went there, da da da, went upstairs to Interscope, ended up meeting the dude, da da da, gave me his card, whatever, bam. At that time, Christian Clancy, the product manager for Eminem's Marshall Mathers LP, was experiencing dissatisfaction in his role at Interscope due to its formulaic nature. You know, labels focus on songs that sound like hits and not feel like hits. And you start to look at everything as a science project, you kind of lose that whole thing I got off on, right? And, and I felt like I was taking a check. And I, I, I checks are nice, but uh, I wasn't fulfilled. David Arodi, both meeting Tyler and seeing Clancy leave, had an idea to bring the two of them together. Clancy had left his full-time gig at Interscope, but was still consulting for the company when his friend David Arodi, who had worked with him at the label, showed him the video for French. I was going to hike in the Himalayas, do yoga, chill the fuck out, and these little fuckers inspired the fuck out of me. A few months went by, I never heard from him, whatever, and I found his card in my grandmother's couch. So I emailed him. He's like, yo, da -da -da, I got someone I want to meet you. His name Name is a Christian coming to the thing. So I went there and I went to the Interscope office to this dude. And he's like, yo, been looking at the random stuff you put on YouTube. It's cool. But my friend, Christian Clancy, who used to work here, really wants to meet you. And in comes Clancy and this dude. And he's like, bro, I love this stuff. It makes me feel like 16 again. I want to punch people in the face. But like, I know, man, you seem really talented. Da -da -da. And me and Clancy kept in contact and the fucking rest is literally history. Tyler and Clancy built a strong relationship with Clancy playing a role akin to a positive father figure in Tyler's life. Tyler's even mentioned Clancy in his songs a couple times. They reminded me of myself at their age. Without sounding cliche, there was just an energy about them that felt different than anything had in a while. The not giving a fuck element was very attractive to me. To be free from what people think is an incredible incredible place to create from. This addition to the collective was like pouring rocket fuel on a bonfire. Clancy's strategic thinking paired with Odd Future's already dedicated cult following was just what the group needed to reach the next level. Throughout the years, Odd Future members would drop their own solo projects, which only pushed the group's popularity further and further. Odd Future's early solo projects are gems in my opinion for the simple fact that they have this homemade DIY aura to them that's better to be experienced than explained. From all the music released by Odd Future, it became increasingly difficult to ignore their movement, and with that came some unwanted comparisons. But I describe you guys as like as like the next Wu Tang. Oh, oh well, we're not the next fucking Wu Tang. I we're think Odd we're like Future, dead ass. Let me, really let me, let me, let me explain why. Because I feel like no, all you guys I know why. Are we're not Wu Tang. They're <laughs> old as fuck. It's a fucking difference. If I was Odd Future, I wouldn't want to be compared to anybody. I see the similarities, I guess, because it's like thirty motherfuckers. But we're not the next Wu Tang. We're Odd Future. And all of you have your own unique deals. And I think business wise, it's smart. The fuck is he talking I don't about? Know. He I don't know. Know. <laughs> Did Wu Tang influence your, that odd future? movement at all because i felt like it but no. i wasn't sure if it did no what and what 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 this is no disrespect to those guys but i hate it when we first came out and that's what we kept getting compared to because i i hate when people just look at surface level shit and are cheap with their opinions mm. oh shit it's nine niggas that's making rap wu-tang like they didn't even really look to see what it is it's nine niggas it's wu-tang like no it's not, look at what we're doing. We're on a whole different thing. And no disrespect to those guys. I was, when, when did the first Wu-Tang album come out? Uh, I want to 95. say 94. 
before there's tribe called quest and nirvana's out my favorite right good very I was very good two history years yeah, old turning fucking three bro i personally feel like i haven't heard a lot of artists that are that similar to them some of these mumble rappers in a way they kind of use controversy to become big it's a bit different with odd future because for them it wasn't just a tool to get big like that's just kind of who they were if that makes sense whereas some of these other rappers they are purposely controversial to become popular. And I think it was a little different for Tyler. It wasn't really the aim, it just was what it was. On February 11, 2011, Tyler released a song that went down as one of his most infamous tracks, Yonkers. Accompanied with a music video of Tyler eating a roach, throwing up, and hanging himself, the video would go absolutely viral after getting tweeted out by Kanye West, calling it the video of 2011. Tyler's main goal with this song aimed to provide as much shock value as he could, and while while he had the world's attention, he encapsulated a message of everything he stood against in the overly polished mainstream music industry. Wolf Haley guy is the guy that I really want to be. He's just fucking crazy. And that's me talking to him and him just taking over my fucking head. That whole song and the walking paradox. No, I'm not. That's me and him going at it within my head because paradox means it's like contradicting, taking back you know shit like that so when you go back and listen to the song every line that i say is like contradicting itself and green paper gold teeth and pregnant gold retrievers is all i want and then i say no fuck money diamonds and bitches don't need them those are basically the same things in different words like a bitch is a pregnant dog that's a pregnant gold retriever like i contradict myself and that's that's me saying no i don't want that but wolf haley is saying yeah you do it's just a it's just a big mind fuck well it was easy to write tyler the creator off as some goofy kid saying whatever he wanted in his music and trying to come off edgy online behind all the playfulness and immaturity stood a truly strategic and creative mind tyler okoma very much had a plan for the music he released while he already had a dedicated fan base who follow his every move yonkers was without a doubt the song that made tyler the creator famous See, it's a nigga with a beard in front of me like, T, nigga, hit him with a classic. <laughs> grabbing his dick. Yeah, nigga, hit him with a classic, nigga. All right, I'll hit him with a classic. <laughs> It would only be two days after the release of Yonkers that Tyler would find himself alongside Haji Beats on national television for the first time to perform this song, Sandwiches. And there stood Tyler, live on a soundstage of Jimmy Fallon's show, wearing a ski mask with an invert across next to Haji Beats, The Roots, and that creepy ass white girl from the ring. Everything Tyler's done has led up to this moment. So Tyler decided to seize the moment and give the audience a show that they wouldn't forget. In an interview with the Rolling Stone, Questlove speaks on a performance. I saw Odd Future on the schedule, and my first thought was there must be some other Brooklyn rock band with the same name. There's no way it was that Odd Future. Once I realized he was coming to Late Night, I immediately went to the Roots dressing room and was like, I can see what's about to happen. We're all about to lose our jobs. Despite Odd Future's evident rise to a network like NBC, they were still considered to be a risky choice to have on live television. With the 19-year-old Tyler jumping on couches, screaming his lyrics in the faces of the guests and somehow ending up on Jimmy Fallon's back, he definitely seized his moment, marking his second biggest impression to the world after the Yonkers video from two days prior, putting an even larger spotlight on where he and Odd Future came from in the music space. Whether he realized it or not, Tyler's performance essentially issued both a call to action and a realization for the mainstream, announcing that if you can get large enough on the internet, that can be enough for you to create a legacy and career for yourself outside of it. Later in the year, Tyler would sign to the British label XO Records for a record deal, the same label under which he would release his sophomore album, Goblin, the second installation of the Wolf Trilogy. The 18-track album didn't let up on any of the darker themes displayed on his first project and was fairly similar in production style. I think Goblin, some of the songs on Goblin age really well. Some other song, it's really a mixed bag. Off top with Goblin, she comes to mind with Frank Ocean. She, oh, it aged super well. Yeah. 
like banger this song but a song like sandwiches tyler the creator and odd feature were making huge strides at what gained them their fame in the first place utilizing their infectious personalities first then showcasing their art but in march of 2012 they would take that strategy to an entirely new level on march 25th 2012 the very first episode of lord of squad premiered on adult swim lord of squad was akin to comedies like the Chappelle show jackass and family guy they just come out scattered because that's how we come up with them yeah I uh, niggas' brains are like, we, niggas grew up watching Family Guy. And that joke mouth look like worked, a child. Dude. Lotus Squad really gave a spotlight to each member of Odd Future and a chance to show off their acting, writing, and directing abilities. Yeah, this, oh, yeah. this is This is smart. This is the brains is behind the operation. He makes us look good. We just TV. make the robbery. <laughs> he make us. <laughs> he draw the plan. He sits on a computer on a phone. Lionel Boys of Odd Future would go on to be a specially talented actor, returning to the screen years later, acting in the award-winning TV series the bear the collective was planting seeds for the creative careers in the future and with so much newfound recognition it was forcing odd future and Tyler the creator to mature even if the mainstream media wouldn't catch on until much later do you feel like you're growing up and that you're changing and your materials I mean changing for over sure the course of time? like for sure it's, everyone grows up you know? yeah you need to go one way or another Tyler wasn't just maturing as a person but also creatively with his art and music and it was really starting to show Tyler the creator's third studio album will be a complete departure from what his fans were used to at the time. Filled to the brim with influences of jazz compositions, Tame Impala, punk music, and Roy Ayers, Wolf was identified as an album that successfully blended the hard-hitting, gritty boom-bap rap with smooth jazz vocals and deeply vulnerable lyrics. Performing Tree Home 95 on Jimmy Fallon's show to promote his upcoming album Wolf, the album was released to the world on April 2nd, 2013. With Wolf came a clear but unspoken message, not to put Tyler the Creator in a box. But it might have been too late. The album was a real first turning point in Tyler's discography. Rather than relying on shock value of essay and serial killers, he decided to hone in on his storytelling skills and production finesse. Even the quality of the album was significantly better than his last two releases, with Wolf being his first studio album actually recorded in a studio rather than a laptop. Featuring songs like IFHY, Answer, and Colossus, Wolf was a more intimate look into Tyler's headspace when dealing with themes of love, fame, and the absence of his father opposed to the front he would put up to the media. Are you That's mad at him that he wrong. desert the family? Nah, dude, I'm stoked. I no. think if I had a dad, if I had a, I think if I had a dad, I would have went the normal college route and like, like a lot of other people. So you're not angry. At I'm so stoked. My life panned out how it was. Wolf was like a breath of fresh air in Tyler's discography, in a sense that Tyler was simply more honest in his music, not just lyrically but sonically as well. Basically, this whole album is just me emulating the music I listen to. When you hear fucking Tree Home '95, like. I know some people hated that shit on Jimmy Fallon, but I fucking I I listen to I love I listen to Stevie Wonder and Isaac Hayes like that's all I listen to. So when you see me on the piano playing fucking chords and shit, like I'm just trying to emulate what I grew up listening to. With a new sound breaking free from his abrasive past and ever-growing diverse fan base, Tyler knew he wouldn't be able to please everyone with this album. But even when he does evolve, and even when he does mature, the mainstream has already put a label on a young artist. When he came in the game, he was super young with Odd Future. And so it's like, nobody didn't really take them serious because it's like, what are these kids doing? They rioting, saying if the authorities, like, they're like, wild people and Tyler specifically like in his earlier albums like they did more shock value type stuff like he was eating a roach and literally hung himself in the video it's like what the world is really going on and then freaking Tron cat like all that stuff at that point everybody was like bro Tyler is on some really weird type stuff. Despite the divided opinions of his new music and despite public perception, Tyler embraced the idea of evolving his sound, style, and creative expression. What would you say is your November? I like that question. I'm a simple person. Um, for a lot of people, music is a way for them to really connect with themselves. It's like a pathway to their inner peace, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I always noticed like when I was at home with my cat, day off with my guitar like that is my that is my time to just meditate and like be with myself first and foremost and have a great time connecting with myself so 
that is kind of my November, just isolation, my own peace, my own cat, my own music. I love it. I do wish music wise though, what would you say? Here's the thing. If I'm ever playing, a, uh, if I'm ever DJing in front of like a crowd where I know there's a lot of odd future fans, what is the one record that you say would be the best one to play that would get odd, true odd future fans like super set? You have to pick one. I so I want Q song. But what's the odd future I song? I don't know anymore. It's changed. It's, it's just crazy. I have older white dudes like 50 years old walking up to me like, hey, love the music. Keep it. I had an older black lady come up to me. Hey, I uh, I don't like the raps much, but just musically, it's beautiful. And I love your brain. Keep it up. I will always be a fan. This is someone's grandmother. As time goes, it gets more and more like that. Because it's very punk, right? My like Everything y'all do is very punk. It's, it's not a... fucking 16-year-old kids only anymore. Yeah. I, it, I look in the fucking where niggas are standing, and it's niggas like y'all just up there singing every lyric. And it's just like, what the fuck? It's girls in the front row getting fucking punched but love the soft songs it's sick so i don't i don't know anymore and that makes me happy and it only makes me trust myself more to can just to continue to just do whatever the fuck i'm doing if i want to make jazz record if i want to make a punk record, if i want to make rap yeah. if i want to go make fucking chairs after the release of wolf tyler's audience would grow increasingly diverse attracting a broader range of fans from various backgrounds and tastes with a newfound confidence in his creative abilities he was ready to take it to another level <laughs> i had a show new year's 2015 and I haven't came out with music in a while. Damn, finally you gonna drop a new album. That show fucking sucked dick. That shit was trash. Well, none of these kids knew was that I was halfway done with a brand new album. Me working with Roy Ayers and Leon Ware and Alice Smith, that's Alice big for Smith. me. He decided he wanted to call me and talk to me before he added his parts or whatever. He called me. He talked like one of those old, cool, like, black dudes. Like, hey, Todd, what's up, man? Hey, no, I, uh... <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> He was like, hey man, uh, man, that, that record you sent is beautiful. Them, I study the fuck out of Roy's production. Yeah, it's crazy. So to hear that from him mm. blew my fucking mind. It was dope as fuck. Shout out to Tyler, we got the same car, it's tight. Yep. <laughs> when I'm not making a song I could drive fast to or while out on stage, I'm trying to figure out the right chords and melodies. We can go down to the rainbow. This nigga Tyler, though, over killed me Nico on Washington Boulevard the day before the carnival last year just because this nigga was listening to some fuck ass turned up death grip shit, bro. While you stand there, let your wings go to waste. Yay, I got Wayne, I got Pharrell. He gave me that fucking Slim Thug 06 Enzo Big Chain Jean Shorts verse. <laughs> What's the first part of his verse? Look, UFO, bow, land. Got Adidas leaf in the grassland, and my finger got a. What? <laughs> Just flexing on niggas. So it's 8 p.m. I'm about to record at Hans Zimmer Studio. I'm a little nervous because this is my first time with an actual string section, but I know it's gonna be tight as fuck. Trust me, a lot of thought was put into Doubling this. Doubling things and tripling. So that should actually be a six. Well, if we're doing lots of- But I'm gonna just pan this one. Coming in with a swell is nice. It might be, so it might be easier to, to have. Yeah. Or, or, no, it should be on, it should be on three. Oh, dog, when you get that finished product, it's all worth it. Tyler, the creator, was using his upcoming album to explore all of his musical inspirations. On this album, Tyler set out to incorporate elements of jazz, funk, and soul, deviating from the more straightforward rap style of his earlier work. Only on 33 percent. That charger is foo foo. <laughs> we go for three hours. <laughs> Damn, that shit sounds amazing. Hey, like, can I hear from the top? My name's Kali Uchis. Usually, he already has something ready, and he'll already have an idea. Most of the time, he writes everything, or he'll have a melody idea. Obviously, he produces everything, so he really hones in on making sure the whole thing is exactly how he wants it to be. I'm glad you put that battery in my 
back, man. When he said that line, man, I was like, but that's your, that's one of your jobs in hip hop. If, I, won't, I don't think it would have been a Yeezus if it wasn't for you. I don't think it would have been like this verse right here if it wasn't for you. It's like, or the shit that Wayne just did. After countless hours of work, collaboration, and extreme dedication to his next album release, Cherry Bomb debuted on April 13th, 2015. It was seen as a departure from Tyler's previous albums. With Cherry Bomb, Tyler expressed his desire to explore and push the boundaries of his musical abilities. Tyler wanted the world to see that he was more than just a rapper. He wanted to show that he had taste, that he had style. Tyler the creator wanted to prove that he was the artist that could pull something off that's never been everyone hated it except for like real music level yeah. who cares about drums and like i opened a rap album with a punk a, a rock song yeah most niggas is like Ugh. And so when cherry bomb came out i was like for sure i'm excited i'm like 14 15 years old and when it first came out i'm like bro i love this because it's so unique and nobody else in hip-hop is doing something like this and so when people uh, didn't like it i was like bro how so it's one of those albums where it really has to grow you you really have to listen to it multiple times to get it especially the lyrics like he's saying a lot of things but i think the sounds and the mixing threw off a lot of people and like deterred them away from the album and they just didn't get it like that but i'm glad that now everybody's coming around and be like oh this is actually a pretty good album tyler creator was seen in the media as this immature and often erratic kid while simultaneously celebrated by his fans as a leader for individuality cherry bomb caught both camps completely off guard he used cherry bomb to communicate that his influences are different from what hip hop's norm was and he wasn't planning on shying away from it this was a ridiculously creative kid who was constantly told he didn't fit in he, he was he was the weirdo kid or whatever the fuck he liked the music that he was watching on TV, but he didn't relate to the music. Everyone, when I was at Interscope, everyone had the same cars in the video. Everyone had the same Air Force One connected Nike. Everyone had the same Scarface poster in their in their cribs, fuck MTV cribs thing. It was That's all so the true. same. It was yeah. the same shit. It's like fucking hair metal, right? Yeah. Like like it's like Nirvana had to come along. Mm, right, like and just explode that, like, that no, thing. Yeah, fuck yeah, yeah. all that. Yeah. Like feel again or yeah. whatever. It goes through phases. He was right in that thing where it's like rap needed something else that like was a different, a, a bit of fuck you, but it was mm -hmm. wasn't fuck you for fuck you's sake. Because mm -hmm. he was really smart about his fuck yous. He knew exactly what the fuck he was doing. 100%. It wasn't just fuck you. It yeah. was like oh, I got you. During the creation of the album, Tyler made an unlikely friendship turned bromance with East Coast rapper ASAP Rocky. Every Everyone, everyone, my boyfriend's here. He's here, goddammit! You're a piece of shit, Tyler. Tell him who you are. I'm not his boyfriend. For the record, <laughs> there's no record. This is a movie. The two hip hop collectives, Odd Future and ASAP Mob, have been compared to and pitted against each other by fans, causing tension between the two groups. Tyler the Creator and ASAP Rocky deciding to go on tour together brought peace between the two collectives and, in a way, set a positive example for their fans to see. That shit just started turning and shit. The niggas just grew up. Everybody got mature. Everybody got about their money. And not only that, niggas just like really cool because i always was a fan you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. he always was a fan it was funny like niggas just never could like fuck with each other like niggas is older now and it's just like we trying to set an example like man that's that power i was telling you about. yeah you know this tour i didn't know what to expect <laughs> it's crazy it, it kind of i think it kind of made me not not judge as much this is really us together like we chose to do this this is not no higher powers like i know what this nigga does there's no one coming around giving this nigga ideas he gets with his niggas and really do what i do he be like yo we need to oh man i need to we need to do this do that that's real creative shit. years later tyler and rocky would make a couple songs together but when asked about a collaborative project the duo decided to leave it up in the air are you guys working on anything together soon uh Probably, probably not. I don't like to talk about things that's not finished Finish. out yet. Yeah. Or like, even if we're not working on anything, I don't even like putting a thought in people's head of things like that because people start making narratives up in their head and then they get disappointed when the narrative they made up doesn't come true. Mm. And then they point the finger at the person who didn't even imply anything. Wow. That's heavy.
<laughs> As someone who's still waiting for the Kendrick and Cole collab album that will never come out, I can personally attest to what Tyler is saying here. It's completely true. Bro, stop. <laughs> They're gonna drop it this month. Okay, no. This is the year that they drop it. It's <laughs> been eight <laughs> years. They're not dropping. This February, man, shit gets scary. What I'm fucking around and drop. Back to the Cherry Bomb and at long last ASAP tour, Tyler would run into some difficulties as he along with Odd Future would get banned from Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Is it a suspension or is this something yeah. where they say, nah, for real, he can't come in? No, is it for a real, I can't. Like ever? Like, I, okay, like I can't go to the UK. Like I can't fly there. Like if it was a connecting flight, I can't fly over it. I can't get on the plane. I thought that I just couldn't go to Australia to like, perform mm -hmm. but right. like i was thinking okay i'll just go out there and vacation or whatever and then i found out that that, that it's, it's no a high chance no. that i can't go there either. banned from the uk Theresa may the then home secretary cited the troubling and homophobic lyrics from tyler's first album bastard as justification for the five-year ban this forced tyler to cancel a chunk of his tour dates that Damn. is it sounds ridiculous it's because one like not to make it about money but that's messing with your money too it's messing with your fans who want to see yeah, you there man. and like you said now you can't even vacation Dude, if you want not only does it, it, it not only messes with like whatever money I would make out there also, but future things. So like, let's just say, oh fuck, I like Whole Foods. I have a sick idea for Whole Foods that could change their whole shit up. The the head the higher ups could just Google me and see that I'm banned right. from those places that easily be like, fuck no. At this point in his career, Tyler felt that his success was slowly slipping away from him. Odd Feature hadn't officially broken up, but everyone seemed to gravitate to their own islands. Sid and Matt Martians of Odd Feature started their own band called The Internet, along with Steve Lacey, Patrick Page, and Christopher Smith. Oh, Sweatshirt found his own lane growing a separate cult following after his albums Doris and I Don't Like Shit, I Don't Go Outside. And after the release of Channel Orange, Frank Ocean was booked and busy being a professional ghost. On top of that, the overwhelming negative response to Cherry Bomb put a chip on Tyler's shoulder. What is your November? My November being within my purpose that God has put me on earth to do, like actually, man, like even working on the videos that I do, that's no my November, just seeing people resonate with something that you create i'm pretty sure you feel the same with your youtube video when people actually watch them you're like dang he's really saying things that we've all thought but he's articulated in a way that's enhanced is really better you know just crap working on my craft just working on different things just pushing myself to limits keeping on expanding and keep on giving back to others like i love giving to others which is why like one of the reasons I made like I read music is to give to like shed light on like smaller artists who don't really have a backing, don't have a label, who don't have the exposure to do these things. And I feel like I'm grateful to be able to do that for so many people, to do that for so many artists. It, it, it really humbles you and really be like, dang, I really am here on earth for a purpose, man. So just fulfilling that purpose, that's my November. Damn, bro. That was beautiful. <laughs> God damn. After putting so many creative influences into his last album, it was time for Tyler to finally build on top of those influences to create something new rather than try to mimic them. It was time for him to water the buried seeds of what he's learned from his previous work. It was time for Tyler the Creator to finally bloom. The, I didn't think people would like this album based on everyone hating Cherry Bomb so fucking much. <laughs> people don't hate it that no, much. No, 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 no. Everyone hated it. It was a small sector of people that liked it. And because I put the instrumentals out, people were coming across to it and starting to appreciate it. When that shit came out, everyone fucking hated it, bro. Everyone fucking hated it. Veering away from Cherry Bomb, in 2015, Tyler decided to take a more personal approach to his music, asking himself questions and answering them in song. For Cherry Bomb, my, my purpose was like, I don't want to get personal at all. Like, I'm gonna just make song. And in this one, I was like, all right, let me write down every feeling. Oh, you like started with emotions. Honest. Just, just, a lot of them was just asking questions. A lot of the songs just have questions, and it's just like, how am I feeling today? Mm -hmm. Fuck, what if I go poor again? What if it doesn't work? And then that's how a lot of the songs just happen. On July 21st, 2017, Tyler the Creator would drop his deeply personal and introspective album, Flower Boy. It was 
clear that Tyler's learned and progressed past the technical shortcomings of his previous albums. This one just felt different. The production was cleaner and well balanced, his lyrics were tighter and thought provoking, and the tracklist felt increasingly cohesive from start to finish. First heard it and well, the more I hear it, I feel like the only like appropriate question to ask you after listening to it is, are you okay? Like, is something wrong? It's like gut-wrenching. It, it's both beautiful, it's very beautiful, but it's like parts that hurt a little bit. Tyler did not hold back on this album. He knew he needed it to hit, and it did. See You Again off this album was the first radio hit that he had. You know how many times I heard See You Again on the fucking radio? You didn't get that before that point. I said, okay, okay. This was his jumping off album. Tyler had his fans, but this is when Tyler officially hit mainstream, mainstream. His song Garden Shed was used as a way for him to embrace his sexuality, becoming a protagonist and voice of the lifestyle he used to antagonize in his younger years. I, I be forgetting all about that. Yeah. Like I'm so used to Tyler Crater saying certain shit. I'm like, oh wait, he actually mean that. <laughs> I'm like, oh. In retrospect, it was pretty obvious, but with Tyler being so much of a troll, it was shrugged off as a joke. Wow, whose purse is this? Cause Fuck there's no Tyler. girls here. Fuck you, Tyler. Oh, this is your purse. Where the bitch is at? First of all, you said the key things. No girls here. Dude, Dude I'm sorry. I'm working and girls are a distraction. No, they not. I know they're girls not because I'm looking for the bros. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Flower Boy was by far the most intimate and introspective album he's put out. Fans have gotten a taste of this on Wolf, but this time it was Tyler more fleshed out and mature. That's one of my favorite lyrics mm -hmm. is just tell these black kids they could be who they are. Dude, like right? it's one of my favorite. God, you had another lyric like that on Cherry Bomb that was just like, uh, the world is yours, little like my little nigga, yeah. the world is yours. Like, yeah. I love that. Uh, like Tyler has always been an artist who's used his platform to promote individuality and creativity, being a beacon of light for those who might have felt alienated or lost in life. Flower Boy was no different. His vulnerability and courage was well received by the masses. The album reached number two on the US Billboard 200 in its first week and got him nominated at the Grammys for best rap album. And the Grammy goes to and just remember guys, we're all winners. No matter what happens tonight, but the, the Grammy goes to, damn, Kendrick Lamar. Although he didn't win, Tyler was already planning his next album. You know, it could be a person or place, just like a happy space, like a, a memory, a point of time, a month, a fucking, a mug or something, you know? Like what, what would you say is your November? What? <laughs> That's a beautiful fucking question. And honestly, I would say right now in this present season, my November is a person. It's definitely a person. It's a person that I met unexpectedly. And yeah, I hope that they be my November friend. <laughs> I have to get all sappy, but. <laughs> so I think everyone should turn 25. I think everyone's dumb. God willing. Until they're 25. If I didn't start, if I didn't started making music at 24, bro, I, uh, if I started at Flower Boy, and then this, bro, I will be a god. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like, I didn't realize I should stop yelling on songs till I was 24. <laughs> After the critical success of Flower Boy, Tyler traveled to Italy to start working on his next studio album, Igor. I went to Lake Como. Why Italy? Why Como? Solange, I've been there. It's amazing. Frank came. But... It was awesome. Yeah. Frank was like, where you at? I was like, yeah, I'm at the house. He was like, I'm going to pull up. Pulled up on the boat. Solange, where you at? She pulled up on the boat. Like. It was a move. It was sick. If anybody thought they had a pin on Tyler's artistic identity after the release of Flower Boy, they were wrong. I think Flower Boy is good and it's my best work thus far. Just because it's an easy listen, but it's so, it's not boring. It's just kind of tame to me. And, um, too, too good? Yeah, it's like, of course you're going to like it. It's nothing abrasive. It's nothing too weird about it. I see. 
it's good songs and stuff, but did you feel it at the time or not? Not at the time. Um, a little bit. Like yeah. I was happy people loved it and stuff, yeah. but it was missing a lot of little things. Like it was mixed too clean and not in a bad way. Yes, it's supposed that I'm supposed to sound crisp and clean, but yes. like it was missing my little tinks that I'm like itching to do, and I had to pull back and restrain myself because this is what the album was supposed to be. Yes. I love cinnamon, but you can't put it on your spaghetti. While on the surface, Igor shares identical melodies with Flower Boy. Tyler wanted Igor to push the line. He wanted a bit of that abrasive chaos that his older fans were used to. I think that's why I made Igor, because I was itching for, ah, I need distortion and an annoying bass and pitch, and this is going to come out of nowhere, and I'll put 18 bridges on one song. Like, I needed that. But it still has some of the musical growth that we first saw flower boy Tyler notoriously has always disliked his singing voice because of his lower vocal register like i really want to sing but my my tone of voice is too deep to do what i want so now i'm just listening to like isaac hayes and barry white and things like that i've always kind of hated my voice mm -hmm. so like my stuff from like 2008 i would pitch it up then 2009-10 i would pitch it down because mm -hmm. I just hated it, so. He's done everything from pitch his voice down on Wolf to pitching it up on Flower Boy to having other artists sing for him on Cherry Bomb. But while working on Igor, Tyler had trouble finding artists to sing on his song Earthquake with Justin Bieber rejecting the song and Rihanna not wanting to sing the hook. Eventually, Kendrick Lamar would hear Tyler's progress on the album and Kendrick gave Tyler some encouraging words and confidence to sing more on his project. I know I'm not the best singer, but a friend of mine named Kendrick was, uh, <laughs> I played him some stuff and he said, oh, oh, this shit is just filling. Like filling, like you weren't worried about the technical per being perfect with your vocal, it was actually motion. And uh, when he said that, it was like, oh shit, you're right. That's why I don't try to always get people to sing my, sometimes I'm just like, fuck it, I'll sing it because someone else can't really sing my truth and what I'm trying to say, so. I got it out. Igor is self-described as an experimental album. The project showed up as an unexpected new world full of cinematic love ballads, heavy distortion, and deeply personal confessions, all tied together with sonics inspired by 80s UK pop soundscapes. Yeah, very 80s pop, kind of <laughs> what I was yeah. going idealistic for. Idealistic love and idealistic heartbreak. Yeah. That's what the 80s were. They were like, not, you don't hold anything back. This album was such a good album to describe situationships. You know, it starts off and he's just in love and everything is perfect. And it's like, let's get together. And then it's like, yeah, now we're together. And then it's like, oh, we broke up and I don't mess with you. But then it's like, hey, can we still be friends? With the creation of Igor came a newfound maturity in Tyler's artistry. Tyler came to the realization that he's reached a point as an artist where his creative kinks are combed out and proved himself to be one of the most polarizing and uncompromising artists of his generation. I was like, oh, maybe I should stop being funny on the internet and maybe people will realize how talented I am mm. or start taking my music and art more serious. But when you're starting but out, you're you trying to get that attention. But you don't realize it till you're 25. <laughs> I didn't know. How old are you? Because I'm also, I'm 28 now. Mm -hmm. On May 17th, 2019, Tyler the Creator released Igor to the World. Along with the album release came a message for first time listeners. With this message, Tyler made it clear that he wanted people to listen to Igor with an open mind. So then I see the Instagram post and he's like, you know, go for a bike ride, like no distractions, vibes, cool. I turned off all my lights. And these fairy lights, they go with music. So I listened to it in the dark with just like these little lights and then they go with the beats of the music. And it was phenomenal. And he said, no distractions. And I said, I put my phone on D&D &D, and I just laid in my bed and I listened to it. And it was like, I was obsessed with that album. From the first listen, I was like, this is one of the best albums that's ever come out. Following the release of that album, Igor immediately gained recognition for being music that was simply a cut above. Finally, Tyler reached his goal of combining the ugly and the pretty in this music. Really? Like when people were like, hey, the album's great. I know, and thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and it's not an ego thing. It's yeah. like, I'm so proud of it. Yes. I put in so much effort and I love it. And I know that it's good. Igor became Tyler's first album to reach number one on the US Billboard 200. While fans were excited for Tyler reaching the top spot, there were some people who were less than happy about the ranking. I gotta say this too, 
I make albums so people can play it and you actually hear it. You know, driving your car, you hear another car playing it. You know, go to the barbershop, you hear them playing it. You know, turn the radio on and you hear them playing it. You know, it's playing everywhere. It's called great music. It's called albums that you actually hear the songs. Not no mysterious shit and you never hear it. Tyler responded to the hate DJ Khaled put on his name with his own set of tweets and comments. To be fair, this shows Tyler's maturity level has gone up because a younger Tyler would have trolled DJ Khaled a lot more than this. In addition to Igor reaching number one, Igor's single, Earthquake, peaked at number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100. In hindsight, it was a good thing Justin Bieber and Rihanna rejected this song because the catchiness of Earthquake did Tyler well, becoming one of his biggest hits. Because you make my earth. Oh my god, nigga, you are crazy. <laughs> And I've Later in the year, Tyler would find himself nominated again at the Grammys for Igor. Tyler was competing for Best Rap Album of the Year, regardless of the obvious pop and soul sounds on Igor. And there he stood, beside music legends Charlie Wilson and Boys to Men, as they sang an a cappella rendition of Tyler's hit song, Earthquake. <laughs> Up to this point in his career, Tyler creator tirelessly worked at his craft and intentionally molded himself into a respectable musician for over 10 years, all to accomplish one of his lifelong goals. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. So talented in that category. Beautiful musicians who did their thing. This is for us. Winning a Grammy Award. And the Grammy goes to... LA stand up, Igor and Tyler, the creator. Yeah. To my mother, you did a great job raising this guy. <laughs> to the Clancy's, my manager, my managers, you guys took a seed and watered it. And I thank you for trusting my ideas. To my fans and my label, again, trusting my crazy ideas. To the new fans, to the old ones, all the crazy stuff I do. I, I, I never fully fe felt accepted in, in rap and stuff. So for y'all to always stand by me and get me here, I really appreciate that. Most black artists get stuck in having to be either categorized as rap or R&B. And it's like, mm, a lot of this stuff doesn't really be R&B. It's like neo soul, alternative, contemporary. And it's like, it all gets put under one category. As somebody who watches the Grammys and as somebody who follows music very closely, I feel like he is on the money. The whole urban categorization of awards and songs and albums is really just a way of saying like, this is black people music. And so for Tyler, I think it was kind of crazy for him to get nominated for best rap album because it quite literally was not a rap album. I feel like I remember him saying, this is not a rap album. So I thought it was very disrespectful, but the Grammys in general are disrespectful to black artists. It's like, even if you get nominated, like that's a feat in of itself because they're not tapped into the culture. As the buzz surrounding Igor continued to echo through the music world, Tyler stood at a crossroads of anticipation and expectation. Having carved out a new bold path with his previous album, the question on everyone's mind was, what would Tyler do next? What is your November? Hmm. My line sisters and I used to spend a lot of time together. We, we graduated, we moved to different places, so I don't get to see them as often. And um, on my birthday, which is in October, they did a whole like three day weekend. They planned an itinerary. Um, they did like charcuterie boards. We went to the club. We did like um, a sip and paint, but like, the sip and paint was based on like uh, them painting like what our first interactions were like. So like the theme was like me and like their relationships to me. And it was just such an outpouring of like love and it was all of us together. And it just was a very good day. Like that was just like the whole weekend. It was just like a beautiful moment of like, wow, I feel so appreciated and loved. And like, I get to be around the people that I love and care about. So I would say that would be my November. It got to a point where I'm just like, Kanye said it in one of them songs, but he's like, is he really better than me? Hmm. You start thinking that, and I'm just like, bro, no. And I felt <laughs> like it wasn't being seen. Hmm. So because of feeling like uh, that, it pushed me to push myself and do Cherry Bomb, because I was like, I want to be the best producer ever. 
I could do every genre. And when that came out, it was like, nah. And I was like, <laughs> y'all think I can't write songs? <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I'm gonna write pop songs. I gave them See You Again. I gave them Boredom. I gave them 911. Like, that's where that came from. And then it was like, oh, he playing it safe now. I'm like, oh, I'm playing it safe? <laughs> Oh, y'all still playing with me? Mm. <laughs> so then I did Igor. But then I was like, not only am I going to go left, I'm going to give these these pop records that just think I can't. And then that's when I did Earthquake. And then it was like, oh, bro, he was never good of a rapper anyway. That's why he had to pitch his voice and sing. Oh, really? Okay. Transitioning from the experimental genre defining sounds of Igor, Tyler's latest project hinted at a return to his rap roots. When Tyler dropped Igor, there was a debate about his status as a rapper. You know, a lot of people are like, can, can he actually like still spit bars or has it just become like, you know, this singy style rapper? Kind of like, you know, what happened when Kanye went, went and did like 808s. So right. I feel like Tyler used Call Me If You Get Lost to shut down that conversation completely. It's like, I can still rap. Mm. I can still do it as good as any of you guys. And I'm here to tell you that I could choose to branch out and do whatever, but at the end of the day, I could go head for head with any rapper. And I think Call Me If You Get Lost helped like cement that legacy. Released on June 25th, 2021, Call Me If You Get Lost became Tyler's second album in a row to hit number one on the US Billboard 200. Call Me If You Get Lost was Tyler the creator at his most audacious and unapologetic. He kind of compounded as an artist. You know yes. what I'm saying? Like there couldn't be a flower boy without Cherry Bomb. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Everything just like added up like over the years. I feel like on Call Me If You Get Lost, he, I would say that's Tyler's style completely refined. The raw product was obviously from all his projects, just like fully compounded on Call Me If You Get Lost. Um, listening to Call Me If You Get Lost, I feel like to be honest, if I really wanted anyone to get into Tyler, I actually would give them that album. Mm -hmm. Just because I feel like it has like, it has so many elements from his previous projects, but like, like I said, very more refined. Like you hear the grit from like his early, like early Tyler, like you hear that grit on songs like Lumberjack, for example, like there's a lot of grit. There's a lot of like, I would say anger. And then you, you, you see a lot of softness, you know, on songs like Sweet, I Thought You Wanted to Dance. Like you still get a very soft Tyler, a melodic Tyler, and then you get the rap fully. So it's just like on Call Me If You Get Lost, he's like, I've done all these things. And before it was kind of separate, like Igor isn't gritty at all. Like you get some gritty songs, like maybe New Magic One, but he's singing. <laughs> For most right. of it so i feel like on call me if you get lost it was just i've done all this i've experimented now i'm gonna gather everything that i've experimented and refine it and just put it on one project to just showcase how versatile i could be following the release of call me if you get lost tyler found himself back in the grammy award spotlight this time around his album's audacious soundscapes and introspective storytelling garnered nominations across multiple categories first off i'm hyped Thank you to DJ Drama. You are fucking so important to rap music. Grills, thank you to all of my friends for being my cheerleaders. Thank you to my whole team, the whole squad. What would you say is your November? The music has always been like a huge part of my life. I went to university in like a really small town. So it was really lonely most of the time. And like my final year was like hell. There will always be like this place where I, I like biking. So I would always like just put on my headphones and just whenever I felt like anxious or anything, I would just like bike. You know, and there was like this pathway where like had like tall trees on like either side. And I would just bike down there just listening to one song on repeat. And that's like Hi by Freddie Gibbs. <laughs> that song has a lot of like memories for me because I would just go back and forth. And especially like in the autumn when like the leaves are like very pretty. Like I would just ride my bike just listening to that song. And honestly, I, that song is like, it's in November for me. What's your November? You know, I've been thinking about it a lot throughout making this video and I feel like it's storytelling. 
I'm like a deep cuts guy. I'm one of those guys that like like to really look into the lyrics and say, oh, this is a metaphor for that. And he was really talking about this as a synonym for that. Like going, like I really love that kind of stuff. So me being able to have my own, uh, I guess, Easter eggs or just small little metaphors that only four people will notice in my own videos is really fun for me. When I was a kid, I used to like be really depressed but people like Kanye, Kid Cudi, Kendrick Lamar they had like these worlds that they just built that I could just escape in even if it was for just like a couple minutes. I just want to be able to do that and give that solace to other little kids like me that like might not understand like I don't know like, I was a pretty weird kid and they they just kind of gave you this feeling of hey dude it's fucking okay I'm weird too and actually me being weird, I made this really beautiful thing out of it. And I just, uh, I don't know, I just really fuck with that. And I just want to add on to that. That's a really long answer, but I would say that's my November. That's cool. Put that in your video. That's so yeah. hard, bro. You should put that at the end. I just, yeah, I just might. Maybe I might uh, switch it around, make it all about myself. Yeah. <laughs> In the deluxe edition of Call Me If You Get Lost, the very last track, Sorry Not Sorry, emerges as one of his most vulnerable and honest songs to date. Looking back on his previous eras, Tyler uses the song as an opportunity to reflect on his past with pure honesty. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I don't see you more. I'm sorry that the four minutes when you see a song can feel like a chore since I'm sorry I'm your kid. Sorry we ain't close as we should have been Sorry to my old friends and stories we could have wrote If our egos didn't take the Sorry to the freaks I let on Who thought their life was gonna change Cause I gave them head But instead I sped off Yeah I know I'm dead Sorry to the guys I had to hide Sorry to the girl I just love the fact that he was being Like he was being real You know embodied all of his alter Like egos and came to say I'm sorry for this I'm sorry for that But at the same time it wasn't beggy He didn't even sound like like extremely remorseful. <laughs> That's kind of what makes the song because like the title is literally like sorry not sorry. His career is very special because his growth over the years has just been crazy. Like when you compare it to when he first started and how gritty his music sounded and how he was able to kind of transition, give us that flower boy to Igor. And I just kind of just switch it up completely. So for someone to have that amount of alter egos, like, and to be able to come and reconcile that with the audience and be like, I'm not gonna just acknowledge that this never happened. It happened. And I'm kind of like stepping and owning up to it. I know I'm supposed to fight, but this eye is shining brighter than a black man's white. I'm gonna make it right. In the meantime, I get some advice. Why these blood diamonds getting cut? Nigga, fuck the price. Spin it then, then again. I can't say niggas, I'm not Superman. I'm sorry I'm pretentious. Sorry that the talent knowledge passing isn't missing. And when I talk my shit and I'm backing up with confidence to get you niggas tripping. Fuck the numbers, fuck a hook, put me on the stage. Let me see y'all hit a stage. Let me see y'all write a page. Let me see you make a decision I'm making. And claim that I don't know about minimum wage or such hey. Water when they catch a bottle to stretch with niggas hey. Thinking it's normal cause you ain't supposed to make it back hey. No two words could possibly summarize Tyler the Creator better. No matter what was thrown his way, Tyler the Creator has always been blessed with an incredible innate sense of self-confidence. Sometimes in our lives we can find ourselves in situations that leave us in complete darkness where we don't know our left from our right. In these periods of uncertainty, it might be worth taking a page from Tyler's playbook to trust what is right and true to yourself while moving forward regardless of what the world to the left or right of you may say. Because the truth Truth is, regardless of what you do, the world is always going to have something to say. So f Thank you. Y'all get home safe till next time.